we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is History Lens with John Davidan, a history professor at Hawaii Pacific University. And we're going to talk about uh, the most significant piece of news that's happening, still still happening these days, the one that has uh, oh, sort of mm, taken the front page from everything else. And Lord knows we have had a lot of things on the front page lately. Um, and this is the... Uh, I don't want to say riots, I'll just say protests, but, but there's, there's a thin line there. Um, and I want to ask him to help us understand um, this set of protests, this national outbreak of protests, as against um, you know, other protests we can study in American history and maybe history elsewhere, uh, to put it in perspective and understand what is going on and its significance. What an interesting show, I can tell you in advance. John, you must be thinking about this 24 by 7. Well, yeah, I mean, I, the thing is, I am writing a book, uh, which is about protest, the history of protest in the United States. Uh, it's called Liberty and Power Protest in American History. But so, um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of questions we were talking before the show. And you mentioned that, you know, is this is this kind of protest uh, baked into American identity? I mean, it's complicated. What is American identity? It depends upon who you ask, what which group has a particular identity at that particular point. Um, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to say for sure, but what I think what you can say, and uh, this is very interesting because uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez actually said this on a 60 minute show. She said, you know, they asked her, I think it was uh, uh, Cooper Anderson said, you know, what about this? radicalism that you you know that you're espousing i mean really isn't it kind of at the edge of american life she said no actually all change in this country has taken place because of radicals that's a paraphrase but that's essentially what she was saying and and so i think it's there's a case to be made that a lot of change in this country has actually been at the hands of the people themselves getting up and out of their seats and out of their houses and saying, I've had enough, I'm not going to take anymore, and doing various things, uh, some nonviolent, some violent, and, uh, you know, then just causing a ruckus, and sometimes things get changed. Well, didn't uh, the Alexa, the, the talk, elect Alex de Tocqueville, didn't he say that democracy was tumultuous? He yeah. almost predicted this as a thread that you would you would see played out across American history. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, but the thing is, you know, democracy can be tumultuous, and uh, we I wish we had a democracy. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's an exaggeration. We we do have a democracy, but it's a very flawed democracy. But interesting that pro I wouldn't necessarily tie. Uh, uh, protest and democracy together uh, too strongly because the thing is when we look at American protest it predates American democracy. If we, if we go back in time then uh, the first protests were before the nation was founded and they're before we, certainly before we had a, a democratic system uh, which doesn't come until the you know the 1830s 1840s so um, so yeah, so when we look at protest, let's let's go back to the colonial period, for instance. And this is a really interesting case. 1765, the British are trying to recoup their costs from the uh, the French and Indian War, uh, in which, by the way, the colonists actually fought. So I don't know why they would double charge the colonists. You know, they fought and they people died in this. You know, colonists died in the conflict, so that's that's considered to be a blood tax. Anyhow, they shouldn't be double charging the colonists for the costs of this. But the problem is the British had big debts after the war. It was a worldwide conflict, uh, and so after the war, the British begin to apply taxes to the colonies to try to recoup some of these costs. And uh, and uh, I mean, they do a sugar tax, which is an external tax, and and then they drop that very quickly. And then in, 18, in 1765, they do what's called a stamp tax, where on all important items that are for sale in the colonies, you actually have to get this official stamp attached to the document or the newspaper or whatever, and you have to pay for the stamp, and that's the tax. And the question is, was it an internal tax or an external tax? Well, I think it was probably an internal tax at this point. But so, so the colonists felt this, 
uh, especially where business people were doing a lot of business, any transaction had to have this stamp on it, which meant there was like, a, you know, it was like a transaction tax. And so the, the, the colonists became unhappy with this and they organized, especially in Boston, Massachusetts. And this is the beginning of the, of the, the Sam Adams, uh, uh, the Minutemen, you know, this group of mechanics and some of them are out of work toughs who are, are organized by Sam Adams. And so Adams organizes a protest in the Boston Common uh, next to this tree, which of course becomes called the Liberty Tree. And, and so the protest begins and the first thing they do is, this is, it's important to get what they actually do because we'll ask questions about this in a minute. They hang an effigy of the tax collector uh, Andrew Oliver from the uh, from the, the this tree, and they hang a couple of I think the lieutenant governor is he he's got an effigy there, and you know so they hang them from the tree first of all, and then they march down to the wharf where this building is being constructed. It's the stamp tax building. It's going to be the building where you have to go to get these stamps. It's partially constructed. They tear apart the building. And they take the wood from the building. They march up to the house of the guy who took the job as the stamp collector, Andrew Oliver, who is a very wealthy Bostonian anyhow. Uh, they pile this stuff onto a bonfire in front of his house, and they throw his effigy onto the bonfire. Now, there's really nothing that's not clear about that. <laughs> it's like... You better think of a different occupation, or otherwise we'll build a bonfire and throw you on. So, so, uh, so this thing was this. These kinds of things were quite common in this time period. That the crowd, the kind of crowd mentality, or what's been referred to as a crowd psychology, uh, is very, very prominent in the colonial period. And so, so the question is, Jay, is this violence associated with this protest? Is it legitimate? Should we should should the should the colonial governor have sent out the constable to arrest these people? I mean, so this is interesting because throughout history you have this question of whether or not it's you know whether or not a particular kind of protest or you know a particular approach is legitimate. Uh, well, you know it's interesting. So after that, not too many years after that, right. we have a constitution. We have a country. We have a democracy where people can vote and, and that should be their way of expressing themselves. Yeah. And we have had certainly a lot of voting and some of it has been successful. You know, other times uh, it hasn't been the perfect democracy, but we do have a system uh, that lasts until today. Yeah. So it, it, my question to you is what, why do we have to have uh, protests and riots yeah. and, and burnings and whatnot when we have a system where you can express your dis dissatisfaction on a given issue? You know, it's a good question, actually. But and I, I think the answer is that for many Americans, uh, the right to vote and voting itself has been held at a discount. And this is an unpleasant reality, but historically, it's absolutely true. And even in today's world, you can find any number of examples of conservative governors who are trying to, in one way or another, suppress voting rights for particular groups, you know, uh, ex-cons, uh, uh, you know, people who don't have access to transportation, a variety of other people. So, so this is an unfortunate part of our legacy that voting has been suppressed in the past and it continues to be suppressed, not at the same level as in the past, but voting continues to be suppressed. So, so the question becomes then if you don't actually, you know, theoretically, according to the constitution, you have the right to vote, but in reality, you don't get to vote for, you know, because your vote is being suppressed, uh, then uh, voting really doesn't help much then for you if you're that person. So this is a problem. This is a problem in our democracy. How important is the vote? How, you know, how significant, how seriously is that taken by politicians? And, you know, right now we have politicians who, you know, leaders who are saying, well, you know, we would never be in power if we let everybody vote shocking stuff like this which is you know totally undemocratic but it's true that we still live in a world that's 
where this kind of thing or these kind of thoughts and these even these kinds of words are being voiced. So in that regard, then what do you do? Well, you know, you can, uh, can, can you wait? Can you wait for justice that doesn't come and then it never comes? And then of course you take action in other ways. So I think that's probably the most important answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, well, in part that, that protest would be a protest against the system, which didn't allow people to express themselves on that issue right. and the regular procedure, regular voting. But, you know, I think we're talking now, and I would really like your thoughts on this, about a, a special genre of protest, a special genre of rioting. It's racial, it's right. race riots. And, and the United States has had more than its share of race riots because, you know, way back to the Constitution, race has been an issue. Slavery has been an issue, and you can track it all the way through the violence on one side and the other. And I, I, I do recall, and I, I'm sure you do too, that in July of 1863, the New York race riots, um, and it started over some issue about conscription into the military, into the uh, Union side of the Civil War, and it wound up with uh, people hanging from uh, street yes. lamps yeah. uh, in New York yeah. City. It was a major race riot, lasted for several days, and somehow that that was a sort of an example of something that turned into that genre. No? Yeah. So you know the the uh, the Stamp Act riots. There's no overt kind of racial element to that. They're probably we don't know actually. There's a lot we don't know about those riots. But when you when you when you move into the 19th century and you move into the era where uh, slavery comes into question. Most of the North has abolished slavery, and the South is now defending the institution. And then, of course, you have a war in which the institution is uh, the question of whether or not the institution of slavery is going to survive is one of the maybe the most important question of the war. Then race is going to play a central uh, role in in the American life, and and certainly in the right. So you yeah, you mean you have the the uh, the 1863 draft riots are nasty, very nasty, because the initial issue is resentment by Irish, uh, you know, Irish immigrants against the United States for uh, for forcing them to serve when their colleagues, their wealthier colleagues, can actually buy a substitute. I mean, I, your typical Irish laborer in New York City cannot afford the $300 for a substitute, but you know, the wealthier parts of New York City, it's easy to get a substitute. You just, you know, it's a part with a little cash and, and somebody else gets that money and, and uh, there you go. So, so there was tremendous resentment against this law, this substitution law that was put in place in the spring of 1863. And that's the initial character of the protest. But it so quickly turns into a, a riot against African Americans. It's it's kind of astonishing. I mean, what did they have to do with this? They didn't they didn't pass the law. <laughs> They're actually uh, they don't have any political power in in New York State, and or in or in Washington D.C. And so, and so you have this situation where uh, where Irish Americans are resentful against African Americans because. When you look at the labor regime in all of the major port cities in the United States, including New York City, then the bottom of the labor totem pole is Irish Americans, and then beneath them is African Americans. And many African Americans work in the shipbuilding industry, Irish Americans do as well. And so uh, Irish Americans are constantly worried about African Americans taking their jobs in this industry. And so this is how some of this resentment begins and you couple it with, with uh, widespread uh, assumptions about the inferiority of African Americans and the nasty way that Irish Americans are being treated in the United States in this time period uh, with you know, the rise of an, of an anti-immigrant anti political party, the Know Nothing Party, uh, and, there, and it becomes this volatile mix that Irish Americans feel like they're being put upon and they blame African Americans. Then they rampage through the city for days. I mean, African Americans are being hung, they're being lynched uh, and a, a school for African American orphans is burned to the ground. Fortunately, they were able to get the, the children out of the school, but it, it's only after uh, 4,000 troops from the Union Army are, you know, they're, they're New York State, but they're, they're in the Battle of Gettysburg. They're brought back to the city and they're able to uh, stop the rioting. So, and, and uh, uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, uh, 
you know, several dozen people are killed, and uh, I think over a hundred people are killed actually, and and more, the majority of them are, are Irish Americans because they're fighting uh, the they're fighting the military, and the military are using live ammunition. Uh, but there's a significant number of African Americans who are lynched and and killed and, and beat to death in this. So yeah, you know, you know the. Uh... Uh, the protests here that are still going on, was it seven days already? Um, you know, ostensibly it's about uh, George Floyd and uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, it's about the fact that he was killed by, um, a, you know, a cop who was pretty, pretty mean and nasty. Um, yeah. But, but uh, you know, completely unfair, completely outrageous, yeah. uh, murderous, if you will. But, yeah. you know, it seems to me that that is only the ignition. Yeah. Uh, and after that, it has a life of its own. And, and the life of its own here, what's going on, is not just George Floyd. It's right. a whole history of George Floyd's. Right. And it's right. a whole history of, of oppression. Am I right? And doesn't it all feed into this? Yeah. So, so after the Civil War, then uh, African-American males are given the right to vote. Uh, slavery is abolished, first of all. African-American males are given the right to vote. You have an era called Reconstruction in which African Americans get all kinds of political power in the South. They even serve in the Senate, in the House of Representatives. One becomes a governor, governor of Louisiana. And so they have political power. And this really rankles at the established white, the former, the former slaveholders, the plantation holders. And, and so they're, they're looking for ways to limit African American power. There are some enlightened elites who want to use African-American votes to gain power. And so you have a Republican Party, which is somewhat successful between about uh, 1870 and 1890. Uh, but by the 1890s, then what you have is you have one other thing that's happening in this time period. And you have what you have is the development of a new political alliance called the Farmers Alliance, which organizes uh, African-American and white tenant farmers. And these African-American white tenant farmers, I mean, they comprise the bulk of voters in the South. So with that, you can actually, you know, there is a time I think I talked about uh, last time or in another conversation where, where the majority of Southern legislatures actually are taken over by the Farmers Alliance <clears throat> and this represents a, a concrete threat to the power of the planter class, and they take action. And what they do, uh, they organize what are called white supremacy clubs. Uh, they actually, it, so, so let me take a specific case. In 1898, there's a riot that takes place in Wilmington in which black power is simply snuffed out. And it's one of the ugliest riots in the history of the country. It's ugly because the white supremacy is so out in the open. These white supremacy clubs, the town leaders force people, force white people to come and, and sign into membership in these clubs. They don't even have a choice. So white progressives, uh, they have this terrible choice, you know, move out of the city or sign on to these white supremacy clubs. And then the election is held in early November, and uh, and actually the white supremacists win a slight majority uh, in the North Carolina legislature. But there's there still is representation among blacks, and this still bothers them. They want to snuff this out, and so uh, the leadership calls for a riot, uh, and they and that's what happens. There are 500, uh, maybe even 2,000 at the height of the violence, but there's this big crowd of, of white kind of working class types who they don't really, they haven't thought this through or anything. They're just working off of raw emotion and hatred. And they march into the, the African-American section of Wilmington, North Carolina, and they just begin to destroy things and kill people. And, uh, and it, it is the end of African-American political power in Wilmington, North Carolina, a place where there had been a significant African-American presence in the business community and in the uh, in, in, in politics. And it's this incredibly tragic moment for American democracy where you see reconstruction just rolled back, not just rolled back, but these visceral, physical attacks on, on upstanding, upright African-American citizens 
Uh, and what in that situation, then it's, you know, it's, uh, it's pure oppression. Yeah. yeah. It's awful. Yeah. So, the, but looking back through the history, the lens, yeah. so to speak, right? What can we learn from these various tragedies that have taken place, uh, really throughout, right. uh, to 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 give us a better understanding of what's happening right now in the streets of yeah. at least half a dozen cities right now today? Right. Well, I do think that the, you know it's it's uh, you don't want to understate at all the oppression that took place in that Wilmington riot, and and so it takes a hundred years from the time of Reconstruction to the time of the 1960s civil rights protests to recover voting rights for African Americans. And one might argue today that they're not yet recovered uh, and uh, that you might be right about that. And then of course you have, in the civil rights movement, you have raised expectations and those expectations are not borne out by uh, you know, material improvements in, in their lives for African Americans. And so you have riots that take place in the late 1960s. 1967 is a summer of riots, 159 cities. July is just a, it's a month of riots. And many of the same cities that we're seeing riots in today, uh, there were riots in, 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 uh, 19, in 1967, in fact, uh, very severe riots in Newark, New Jersey, uh, 23 people dead in those riots and lots of property damage. And yet today, no property damage, no deaths. And there are peaceful riots taking place in Newark. And you have to ask the question, well, what's the, what's the difference there? Well, one thing, one difference is that the mayor has organized uh, community leaders to organize African-Americans in that, in neighborhoods and such. And so they're very well organized. They're much more discipline. The other thing that happened is they asked the police to come out without their riot gear on. And this made a huge difference. It just brought the tension level down completely. So unlike the 1967 riots where, you know, police are heavy handed and they're ready with full force and, you know, it's all about law and order. Uh, then, uh, you know, the, 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 the arena that's working right now is the arena where uh, the police presence is really muted and that might be part of the answer is to i mean uh, police police forces know this everybody knows this in the business that when you put on a bigger police presence you're going to have bigger riots more destructive riots uh, this was the concern in minneapolis last week about bringing out more forces or ordering the national guard in is that you would have riots that would turn protests that would turn destructive uh, but there are, so, so I, Jay, I think that the answer is that there's a sense of uh, hopelessness, a sense of uh, grievance that's not being addressed adequately, just like there was in the 1960s. Uh, and at some point, what do you turn to? I mean, uh, the political system for these folks doesn't change, right? It seems to be that, the, you know, you have white power on top and black, blacks are, under, are the underclass and nothing seems to change. And so... In that situation, you know, a riot, a, a peaceful protest can break into a riot. Now, there are other things going on in these protests. And this is unprecedented and very strange that you have these kind of fifth columnists. You have, you have infiltrators, you have extremist groups, accelerationists, uh, uh, you know, who, who are, uh, and, and others who are, who are actually very interested in fomenting uh, these uh, making these riots more violent because the accelerationists, very shadowy group we don't know much about, their goal is civil war. They want to they want to perpetrate civil war in this country. So <laughs> there's a there's another element to this which is really scary and unprecedented. I don't I've never seen that before uh, in a riot where you have peaceful rioters and then they're, they're peaceful pardon me peaceful protesters and then their protest is actually co-opted by these violent extremists. Hmm. That's, I, I don't know, you know, that, that's not good. Hmm. One, one other thing that strikes me is that you always have to account for the changes in technology. Um, you know, back when uh, there might've been telephones and there might've been a certain amount of television, say 67, yeah. but uh, we have a lot more, a lot more telephones now because there's smartphones and we have right. a lot more 
uh, programs on them like social media. And, and of course we have lots of, and lots of television. Uh, yeah. And one of the things that I read about, I think it was just this morning, was the remarkable change in the way that a number of, and I don't know whether they were the, uh, you know, the, 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 the peaceful demonstrators or the accelerators uh, or were the police. In, yeah. in many cases, I think it was the police, but they've been taking aggressive steps against the media. They've been attacking the media. And if you found it one time, you'd say, well, this, that's just one person. But it's yeah. been a number of occasions and that, that has to be a historical shift, don't you think? Uh, well, you know, I think actually uh, reporters have always been uh, targets in riots, in violent riots. Uh, they, you know, they've always risked, risked their lives by going out and reporting on these riots. But it's a little different in that you have a president, you have the person in the White House who actually openly attacks uh, the media uh, all the time. And therefore, uh, you know, this constant slander against the mainstream media it gets into people's heads, and they might have these these people might have completely different views than uh, than uh, than Donald Trump, but but they don't like, for instance, CNN. I mean, the, this crowd. I think that's something that Trump created. This attack on CNN in in Atlanta can be laid directly at his feet because he's attacked CNN for or well before yeah. he became president, you know. So yeah, that's very disturbing. And we, we just, it's the exact opposite of what we need from a leader. I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, we have uh, Joe Biden, presidential candidate who's, who spoke today in Philadelphia and he laid it out. I mean, it's, we are just so bereft of, of decent leadership uh, in the White House that it's, it's, uh, that's part of the reason why these riots have happened. Yeah. Well, it, it strikes me from what you've said, <clears throat> I think this could be our lesson, is that with, with the media, with the ability to communicate to a number of people yeah. at the same time, however you do that, uh, you can have a calming effect. You, you may not be able to stop the protests, but at least you can calm it to some extent if you do the right things. And it, it doesn't take a whole lot of, you know, a lot to be a calming effect. A Biden could be a a calming effect. Right. But if you have somebody who throws kerosene on the fire, yeah. well, that then you get this. Yeah. So it's a big leverage point. I think we have learned that from this experience, don't you think? Yes, I think in some, you know, this is bizarre to even consider, but I think there's, this is true in some ways that Donald Trump is kind of an anarchist himself. He has this destructive streak that, uh, you know, it's, it's dangerous. It's been dangerous and you, know, you, can, you can identify numerous ways in which he has damaged our country in his four years of, of being in the White House. Uh, but so, yeah, I mean, you have somebody in the White House who in some ways, I don't know where this comes from quite honestly, but there's a part of him that would like to be there throwing rocks in the, you know, throwing rocks into these stores. Uh, and, you know, of course, there's this other part of him who, who wants to somehow lead a country, but he really has no idea how to do it. And he hasn't learned a thing from these four years. It's, it's if, if anything, it's even worse, this kind of divisiveness that he has spread in this country. So, Well, so speaking of divisiveness, you know, and, and uh, making things worse, I mean, we started out with COVID. We started out with a reopening that's questionable, or an economic reopening that's questionable. Exactly. We started out with a dysfunctional government in general, right, um, and, a, and a sole proprietorship, a dictatorial uh, president. Yeah. Um, now the riots, yeah. call it demonstrations. Right. Uh, you know, when they go on for seven days and burn down the city blocks, that's a pretty serious demonstration. It's, they're very serious riots, yeah. And so my, my question to you, and to put it in perspective is, you know, this is going to actually make all those other threads worse. It's, it's not, it's not going to uh, lend help to restoring good government necessarily. It's not, it's, it's probably is going to make COVID worse. A lot, of, a lot of people who didn't, who would not necessarily have caught the disease will catch the disease because of proximity and all that. Um, it will certainly, certainly, certainly not help the reopening and the economy and the willingness of people to go out and participate in the economy. Um, is, is a huge loss on top of a huge loss. Um, yeah. So my question is, 
what 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 do we do now to recover and you know unless we solve the underlying problems uh isn't this going to happen again well maybe another way to ask the question is are riots useful in any way ah okay that's an interesting question and we have to go back to the the stamp act riot which was incredibly useful the british actually backed off of the stamp act after these riots and they stopped so I, I think we can't assume that these riots will not be useful in any way. I mean, they're very destructive and you hate to see that. Uh, but we don't know. I mean, we don't know. It took uh, 10 years, right, after the Stamp Act riots uh, for, for a revolution to break out for the kind of the ultimate consequence. So we're still in this. We don't really know what the results of these riots will be. I, I tell you one thing, though, I've never seen uh, as large a group of peaceful protesters protesting against uh, violence against African American men by the police. I, these protests eclipse the 2014 protests by a lot. I've never seen this before, which is, uh, it indicates to me that there's actually a good thing going on, that people are becoming more and more aware of this issue of racism and and uh, and you know it's uh, unfortunately you know we kind of in the Obama period we sort of assumed well come on we we elected him president we've definitely made racial progress right and we just it was very I think it was more difficult for us to confront that racism is is okay I'll I'll use a term you were talking using uh, baked into American identity it has become uh, you know the one of the most important narrative pieces of our history. It's, it's a terrible tragedy in our history. But so if we can confront, I mean, this gets to your, your point that, you know, let's, let's try to get at what's underneath this. If we can get at the underlying racism in police departments, uh, in, you know, in law enforcement and in other arenas of American life, we, you know, then, the, then I would say, you know, the, these riots are terrible things, but they actually, they might have served as a wake-up call to this country. So, yeah, that's uh, that's well taken, John. But uh, in any event, you'll have to agree with me that these riots, as so many other things during the Trump administration, are historic. They Indeed. are historic. They will never be forgotten by any historian. Indeed, yes, yes, that's true. John David Ann, professor of history at HBU, thank you so much for coming on, on, on History Lens. We so enjoy discussing these things with you. Thanks, Jay. Good to be on. Aloha.